Okay, one more try. So what are we gonna do today? We're gonna talk about the basics of the probability theory. We're gonna talk about power law distribution. Uh, we talk, we discuss what scale free, scale free networks are. Um, we'll look at the distribution of parameter estimations um, and we'll talk about Zip's flaw. So <clears throat> continuous random variable. Um, for those guys, for those we can easily calculate probability density function, and uh, I'm sure you're familiar with this. Okay, so probability density function PDF. Um, and, uh, you know, in fact, it's just an integral from A to B of uh, from X dx gives us a probability that the random variable is within the interval from A to B. Um, and the only thing we need uh, for this function is to be greater or equal than zero and the integral over the entire um, definition domain um, should be equal to one. We're going to be working with uh, so-called CDFs, which is cumulative distribution function. Um, that is just an integral of P at X dx, uh, or the derivative from um, CDF is our distribution function. And um, we'll see that it is very convenient to define uh, what's called complementary cumulative distribution function, which is CCDF, which is in fact just a probability that random variable is greater than X. So just um, to give you an idea, if we have a Gaussian distribution, and I'm sure you're very familiar with it, um, on the left side, um, on the left side of the picture, we see um, PDF. On the right hand side, on the right side, it is cumulative distribution function. It looks very different if we uh, look at the exponential distribution. Um, on the very left side, we'll see uh, decaying density, which is a PDF, exponential function. Then um, next picture in the center, that is a cumulative distribution function, and it is in between zero and one. And so it pretty much shows us the, the share of their um, random variables that are uh, below the particular value that is selected. And on the right picture, we see CCDF, which is a complementary uh, cumulative distribution function. But this time, it is plotted in log log scale. Well, in fact, if you try and calculate um, the CDF uh, and then CCDF, you realize that CCDF has the same uh, form as the PDF itself. And so the fact that it is a straight line in log log scale, it really means, I'm sorry, in log, it is a log on the on y axis. I'm sorry, it's log on the on y axis. Um, it is a straight line, right? And you can easily see that, but if you take an exponential function and take logarithm on, on, on the left hand side, right, it will be a logarithmic function. Uh, on the right hand side is just x. Um, again, this sort of some basic facts that you probably remember from probability theory. Now, if we're dealing with discrete distribution, um, then we define what's called probability mass function or PMF, or sometimes it's called probability density mass function. Uh, but the idea is uh, pretty much the same. So it is equal to the probability that random variable is equal to x. Um, in this case, instead of uh, integration, we use summation to normalize things. And <clears throat> the same way we can define a cumulative distribution function, which is just the sum of all um, values less or equal than x. Though we're going to be dealing um, in this course uh, with mostly discrete distributions, uh, and experimental distributions and discrete distributions. And in the networks, we're going to be looking at uh, the distribution of the node degrees. That is the number of nearest neighbors, 
which is a discrete variable. Um, we will look at the formulas in continuous distribution. Um, the reason uh, for that is because um, with discrete distribution, you get all kinds of sums, and um, the, the, they're actually difficult to evaluate. Um, with continuous distribution, you have integrals, and it's pretty easy to take those integrals. And in the limit, um, we understand that discrete distribution functions will you know, slowly approach continuous distribution. So whatever um, we get as the limits, <clears throat> whatever we get in continuous distribution functions, we'll sort of believe that that's the limiting behavior of discrete. So if you look at some empirical distributions, and empirical meaning, you know, we just go out there and measure. And let's, for example, look at the empirical distribution of heights of, say, uh, of, of people, or, say, distribution of speeds of cars on a freeway. Um, typically, uh, they're clustered around some value. And in fact, they, they, they come from uh, sort of Gaussian distribution, normal distribution. Um, and that's the, the top, uh, top pictures on the slide. At the same time, if you look at um, some other economic data, let's say, for example, we look at uh, the population of the cities and the percentile of the cities, or well, number of the cities with that population. So let's say we're going to look at the distribution of the sizes of the cities in the country or in the world. Um, all of a sudden, we'll see that, well, there is no typical size of the city. There are some cities that are, the majority of the cities has very small population. Um, so there are like a lot of cities with a small population, but there are cities with a, with a very large population. There are not that many of them, but they are out there. Um, and so the distribution of the size of the cities uh, is very, very different uh, from the distribution of, say, human heights or speeds of cars. Um, in some sense, if, um, say, the height of a human would be distributed the same way as a population, uh, as a population of the cities, uh, we would, you know, see people uh, of, you know, four or five, ten meters height or, you know, centimeters height, which we, of course, do not see. So um, it is clear that, <clears throat> for example, um, human height and the population of the cities are driven by very, very, very different statistical processes um, that leads to very different distributions. So if we again look at the uh, population of the city distribution on the left, um, bottom left picture, um, you see it decreases very, very fast. And um, you already seen in the, uh, in the lab that, um, in order to see this type of a picture, um, you need to plot it in log-log scale. Um, and on the right side, it is in the log-log scale. It's almost linear here. And we'll see why in a second. So in fact, this is a, this is a power law, and this is a, the topic of today's lecture. Um, and power law is really um, just <clears throat> a function where p of x is uh, proportional to x to some power. Um, I mean, if, you're, if you remember a little bit of physics, for example, this law is, is not very exotic because, you know, um, you think about the forces that are um, 1 over x squared or, or potential energy that 1 over x, um, and that, that examples of power laws. But... Uh, if they're common in, a, in, in physics, they have not been explored a lot in social sciences or, or in economics or computer sciences. Um, so again, power law is when P from X is <coughs> uh, some constant X to the power um, alpha. Um, and alpha in this case is positive, right? So it is the functional form of one over x to certain power. Um, and for this to make sense, um, you typically would define 
x to be greater or equal to some minimum value. So x should be greater or equal than some x min. Um, and we need this to avoid division by zero. Now, power laws are quite tricky. Um, and the, first of all, uh, you realize that if we want to, well, it's a distribution, right? And so um, in order for this function to be a distribution function, it has to be normalized, which means the integral over the entire domain has to be equal to one. Well, if you look at this integral, uh, which is on the second <coughs> line of the slide, um, you see that uh, we do dx over x to the power alpha. Now, if alpha is equal one, or even le or less than one, if alpha is one, this integral is logarithm. And logarithm on the upper on the upper bound at infinity will diverge. If alpha is less than one, <coughs> we'll get um, even stronger divergence. So this means that uh, the power law function is normalizable only for alpha greater than one. And so it's only for alpha greater than one, it actually uh, can behave as a distribution function. Now, well, we can take this integral if alpha is greater than one and find normalization constant. And sometimes it's convenient to write the power law PDF um, the way it's shown at the bottom of the slide. So the only thing I have done here is I substituted um, the, the constant into the equation. Okay, so the key point here is that uh, power law is really defined um, as a distribution function is defined only for alpha greater than one. Because otherwise you cannot normalize it. Now here is a very important picture um, actually, I'll try to draw on it. Um, I hope it will not slow down the, it will not interrupt the speech, but we'll see how it works. Um, please let me know if you start getting troubles with, with hearing me. Okay, so <clears throat> first of all, the sort of traditional Poisson distribution, right? Um, we have um, it, it goes up and then down, uh, Poisson distribution defined for discrete values. Um, that's why there are dots here. Uh, we'll just connect them with lines for, for ease of seeing. Then there are a couple more distributions here. There is an exponential distribution, exponential decay here, um, a green one. And there is a power law function, blue one. Um, if you look on the inside, you'll see the zoom in region starting from somewhere here, right? That's we zoomed in. And notice that the power law is much, much, much higher here than um, Poisson or exponential function. So, <clears throat> which means it decays much slower than either Poisson or exponential function. So <clears throat> that also means that for certain events that, my ex that the probability of those events are negligible in Poisson um, or exponential functions, they're quite probable in the power law. And that's why power law function is also called you know, fat tail function. Because the tails, they do not decay fast. So that's one of the things, one of the critical, another critical things about power laws is that it has fat tails, which means um, rare events, well, oh, events far away on this, on the X axis, so events here, their probability is not that small. Um, and that's, we need to, to have in mind. Um, any questions on this slide? Okay, let's try to move on. <clears throat> so, um, if we look at the power law uh, distribution function, uh, PDF, well, we have seen it already. And we can actually calculate 
for this function uh, CCDF, um, complementary uh, distribution function, which in fact just <clears throat> nothing more than um, taking an integral, taking an integral um, and just doing it nicely <laughs> and without mistakes. Um, and that's what we get as a result. Now, I strongly recommend you guys to actually take this integral yourself. There is, you know, it's, it's, it's not difficult at all, uh, but you need to be careful with the sole um, exponents. Now, one thing to notice is, look, <clears throat> this is exponent of uh, power law distribution function itself. Um, now this is exponent of um, complementary uh, CDF. Notice that both of them are actually power laws. It's just one of the power laws. The first one, the, the, the power law itself has alpha here. Um, this one has you know, one degree less, um, which in fact <clears throat> means that we can use this. And let's say if we're gonna be looking um, in, into log log scale, um, both of them power laws itself, the distribution function, and complementary yeah. distribution functions. Both of them will be straight lines <clears throat> in the log log scale. <clears throat> and we're gonna use that um, later on. So <clears throat> here's a couple more comparison. And, I, and again, I'm drilling on this because um, you know, this is a key property of those power laws. So <clears throat> if you look at this, we see power law, um, this is a log log scale. In fact, um, this is not X, this is supposed to be log, and this is also log. So <clears throat> when you're looking at the log log scale, if we have a power law, then in the log log scale, it's going to be log of power x um, will be a linear function of log of x. And if we plot log of x on x axis and uh, log of p of x on the y axis, well, um, we're going to get a straight line. And alpha uh, is the slope of the line, and log c is just how it's displaced vertically. Well, if we look at um, <clears throat> the CCD CCDF, um, it's also exponential. And so on this picture, it also will be a straight line. Now, we can compare it to the exponential function. And um, in exponential function, if we take logs, um, you'll see a log on the left-hand side. But on the right-hand side, it will be x itself. And so if you want to draw it or to plot it, it has to be expressed again through the log of x if you want to have logs on the axis. And which means um, that if this is a power law function, this is a power law function, um, these are exponents. And so in a logarithmic scale, you can actually see how much faster exponent or exponential function decays than power law. I, I keep talking about it because of the following reason. Um, in very many cases, when we try to experimentally measure the distribution function, we would like to decide for us whether it is exponential distribution, whether it's Poisson, whether it's Gaussian, or whether it's a power law. And the simplest way, the easiest way to find it out is by actually plotting in the log-log scale and seeing if we have a straight line. So if we have a straight line in a log-log scale and whether you, whether you plot the distribution function itself or whether you plot a CCDF, in both cases, it's a signature of a power law. Now in practice, we might see that um, there are different parts of the space where, where we'll have different slopes of those lines. So the, the total distribution will be built out of <clears throat> several power laws but still power laws. Okay, so here's a few examples. Um, 
this is this is a few examples of empirical distributions. Um, these are taken from um, the paper by uh, Mark Newman, and um, the paper is available on our site. So if you're interested, you can read more about this. Um, it just shows very different, um, very different distributions that exist out there um, in the world. Uh, first of all, um, the, the famous one, uh, which is the word frequency. So it's uh, the frequency of the words in the language, and we actually talk about this uh, a little bit later today. Um, another example is, for example, the citation network. Um, so how how many papers, how how many times they have been cited? Uh, we're getting histogram, and if you notice, there is also a straight line here, but you know the, it's not power law at the beginning. Um, or for example, book sold, um, the same sort of idea of the power law distribution. There are a majority, <clears throat> there are some books that um, are bestsellers, but there are only a few of those books, right? So there's a book sold, these are bestsellers, and there are very few of them. Majority of the book, um, they're selling, but not maybe not that much. And um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Number of calls received, uh, their, their magnitude of earthquakes, you know, population of the cities, frequency of the names, um, net worth of people in U.S. dollars, and that's sort of this, the famous principle that, um, you know, that, that, that the Pareto principle that <clears throat> most of the of the money, most most of the wealth belongs to just a you know, uh, few percentiles of of the population. Right, twenty percent of the population owns more than eighty percent. Um, of, of the uh, world um, currency or world values. So <clears throat> um, these are all power laws. Now, um, you might get an impression that everything in the world is a power law. Well, um, it's not, but uh, quite often um, there are you know, a lot of empirical distribution, they, the distributions, they do, contain, they do contain pieces of power law. Okay, now, power law, the, the, one of the reasons we keep talking about this is power law is quite tricky. Um, compared to it, like Gaussian distribution or exponential is, is very simple and straightforward. So here is another example of um, you know, issues we can get with a power law. Look, um, Typically, for a distribution, um, you know, when, it, when, when some random variable is distributed a certain way, um, you might want to learn, you might, you might want to know, say, the average or mean of the variable um, and standard deviation. And, you know, if we talk about Gaussian, say, distribution, yeah, we know that mean and variance, sort of, it's, it's all easy, and in fact, they define the distribution. Well, um, with power law, life is somewhat different. Look, um, I'm trying to calculate uh, mean or average. Well, it's just x, px, and uh, we define that it goes from x mean, so you know, everything is cool and nice, except for um, this moment. Notice that when we substitute uh, p of x here, um, the, the, the coefficient drops from alpha to alpha minus one, and that means that the integral, because it has it goes to infinity up here, will diverge unless alpha is greater than two. Now, if alpha is greater than two, this integral converges, and you know there is a value for x average. <clears throat> With standard deviation, it's even worse uh, because we have here x squared. Uh, the power drops here two times. Uh, for this integral to converge on infinity, we need to have alpha greater than three. So this is a little bizarre. Uh, you know, you have a bunch of data points. And uh, what this actually tells us that we cannot calculate the average or deviation. This is really strange, right? Well, I mean, the, <clears throat> the truth is um, that, you know, in, in real life, when we try to calculate these things, we, in fact, will not go to infinity here. What's going to be happening is 
Are we going to go to some maximum value? Um, the reason for that is simply because our distribution <coughs> is not infinite. So it contains finite number of data points and data samples. And among those, da those data samples, there is the largest one. And, and so um, there is no infinity. But that brings a very, very important and interesting point. Notice that if I actually take this integral um, as is, but um, I will use, um, instead, of, instead of infinity, I'll use maximum value, then, of course, the result will depend on this maximum value. Notice that when alpha is greater than two, alpha is greater than two. And this x max increases and goes to infinity and alpha is greater than two. Then this second term goes to zero. And everything is cool. Now, if alpha is less than two, if alpha is less than two in here, then um, what happens is when x increases, this entire sum increases. Now it has minus in front of it, but if alpha is less than two, there is a minus in here, so it uh, still remains positive. But it also means that your x average will depend on x max. And uh, will be proportional, in fact, to x max. So what's gonna be happening is the following. You take the bigger sample you take, the larger x max will be in that sample. And so the larger x max, the larger is x average. And so you're gonna see this, the following picture. You increase your sample size from your distribution, and all of a sudden you will see that sample mean is not saturating, but growing. And of course, variance will be growing too. That happens if alpha less than two. Now, if alpha is greater than two, just a little bit greater than two, then for example, for mean, everything will be good. It will converge to the mean of the population, but variance still will be undefined. And only for alpha greater than three, mean and variance will behave nicely. So what that really means is the following. When you make experiments, you rarely have access to the entire population, right? When you make experiments, here's your population, here's your world. When you make experiments or get some data, you actually take a sample. And uh, you know, with, with nice distributions like Gaussian distribution, um, the mean of the sample, right? The average in the sample is actually going converging to the average of the population. That's sort of the basics of sampling. Well, well um, with power law, the mean, if alpha is less than 1.7, is gonna be growing with the size of your sample. And so you need to grow the size of your sample to the entire population to actually get um, the correct answer. Okay, so the practical um, conclusion here is the following. When you're dealing with power laws, if your power law is less than two, um, mean doesn't make any sense. You're not gonna get the correct estimate of the mean or variance. If your power law is um, in between two and three, uh, you'll get a good estimate, you might get a reasonable estimate of mean, but computing variance is useless. It will depend on the sample size. And it's only for the power laws that have alpha greater than three, uh, both of them make sense. Now, let's try your microphone. If I cannot compute mean, uh, is there any other value I can use to characterize uh, the distribution? Yeah. All right, I either cannot hear you or, yeah, oh, I, can, I can read, all right, yeah, median. So median is much more stable, and this is actually one of the cases where it makes total sense. I mean, you know, sometimes when you, do, when you use Gaussian distribution, 
um, mean and, and median, uh, you might ask, like, why in the world would I use median you know, if mean is good? And in Gaussian distribution, it's no problem. But in the case uh, like this, um, you're actually better off using median, um, simply because mean will depend on the sample size. Right, now, the good news is that pretty much all of the sort of known distributions are, have alpha greater than two. And so the mean is, is defined for them. And in fact, networks, um, and we're gonna be talking about a lot about networks. Um, in, in networks, the power law is uh, around three or a little bit greater than three. So um, we, we're lucky in the sense, and uh, we can deal with sampling, but it has to be done very carefully. So I hope this example shows you um, that with a power law, just taking simple mean is not a good idea. Okay, any questions so far? All right, the microphone's probably turned off, so I will not hear any questions. Um, but if Andre's microphone is on. All right. <clears throat> so one of sort of another name um, of this is a scale invariant distribution. So why is it scale invariant? It's scale invariant because of the following reason. Um, <clears throat> Let's look um, at the, the value of the distribution when we do probability of bx, and b will be some constant. So this constant can be factored out, and so um, we can write it this way. And if you notice, it steals x to the power minus alpha. So in some sense, and I guess there will be a better <clears throat> example right now, um, let's do this. We can write, okay, let me try to write here. Okay, probability of say 100x divided by the probability of 10x because of this property is will be equal to probability of 10x divided by the probability of x, all right? So <clears throat> this means that we can change scales, but if um, the value is distributed, <coughs> um, this means that uh, if the value is distributed by this power law, um, then this ratio uh, will, will stay the same. In other words, um, the total number of people the rate, the total, okay, the ratio of the total number of people who make $100 per hour to the total, not, to the people who make $10 per hour is the same as the ratio of the number of people who make $10 per hour to the people who make a dollar per hour, okay? So the ratio of, um, you know, total number of large earthquakes to the ratio, to the number of medium, uh, earthquakes is equal to the number of medium earthquakes to the number of small earthquakes. And that's what's sort of shown here um, on, on this um, diagram. And it's clear that there is this sort of <clears throat> ratio, especially if you, if you think about it in, in a logarithmic scale. But this is another sort of key property um, of a power law. And that's why it's also called scale invariance. And in fact, very often, power law and networks, they're called scaled invariant network. And that's the reason. Okay. okay. Oh. So here is a few examples of power law histograms. And um, I'm not sure if you already done this in a lab, but on the second slide, uh, 
right here. Right here, you will see something that looks like a noise. Well, this is not noise. This is actually a property of, of, of the power law distribution. Um, and it, when you zoom in, you'll realize why this is happening. Uh, but it's clear that by having that picture, by having that, those oscillations, um, there in fact will prevent you from feeding easily um, to the slope of this um, of the power law. So it's not clear, you know, if you want to feed a straight line, um, whether it just goes straight here or somehow here, or maybe it should go that way. Um, we'll see in a second that it is much better to actually do things like that. Um, and the way to do it is instead of PDF, considering a cumulative distribution function. Cumulative distribution function actually has this nicer, much nicer behavior. <clears throat> okay, so what does this have to do with, uh, um, with networks? <coughs> well, um, here, here is a sort of the, 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 the key of the story. We're going to consider the distribution of the node degrees of the network. So node degree is a number of neighbors or number of friends. Um, and the idea or number of links that, that attaches to every node. And for a second, let's think about um, networks as undirected, right? So the, the, there is no direction on the edges. So there are some nodes with a few connections. And here they are. Notice there are nodes with a few connections. There are nodes with sort of several connections. And their nodes are really, really well connected. And so the degree of the connection or the number of these nodes are distributed by power law. So the idea is that in uh, most of the networks, you'll have some nodes that are very, very, very well connected. So they have very high degrees, but there will be not that many of those. At the same time, majority of the nodes will have low degrees. There'll be very many of those. So that's a typical power law distribution. Um, I think about it this way. Um, you know, like say the web pages on the, on, on the web are distributed based on the power law. So there are some web pages like, you know, CNN, um, Google, uh, Yandex, um, that have lots and lots of links pointing to them. And so they have very high degree, but there are not that many of them. At the same time, the majority of the sort of just layman, uh, <clears throat> layman person pages, just sort of regular pages, they are very low degrees, but there are tons and tons of them. Um, the same goes with, with say Facebook or, or any social network. You might think of there are people that are similarly popular, they're celebrities, have tons of connections, uh, but there are only a few of them. Majority of the people live sort of in this side of the distribution, right there. Here's a comparison. <clears throat> what would a uh, world look like if um, the distribution was not power law, but say, you know, traditional well, bell curve or, or Gaussian distribution, right? There'll be sort of certain average number of links that every web page would have. And there will be some sort of, you know, some pages higher with more links or less links. Um, but we wouldn't have any very, very highly connected nodes like we have with like you know, CNN or, or other popular pages. Um, and at the same time, uh, you know, we will not have sort of pages with very, very few in links, but we do have that in real life. So <clears throat> we're living in this world. Um, and the social networks, they are, uh, they do obey power law distribution or scale-free distribution. So just to reiterate what I have, what I just said, <clears throat> um, so not degree distribution is, is defined um, through the number of nearest neighbors. So we'll call it KI. Um, and it goes from one 
to k max, right? So we'll consider on the connected subgraphs. Um, and the smallest node degree for a connected subgraph is equal to one because you want the node to be connected to graph. And k max is a maximum node degree. And yeah. we'll talk about um, this degree distribution. This is a discrete uh, random variable, right? A discrete distribution. And uh, of course, you can normalize it, you know, by um, just counting how many uh, nodes with degree k over total number of nodes. So in this case, power law is in the sense that we're counting how many nodes have degree k. Um, how many nodes has uh, degree one, which is how many nodes have just only one neighbor, uh, how many nodes have one friend versus how many nodes have two friends versus how many nodes have nodes have you know, 100 friends, 1,000 friends. Now, <clears throat> um, we, we could try to um, normalize those kind of things. And the normalization is actually goes, you know, if, if I try to do math on this thing, um, I, I will get into Riemann zeta function. Well, we shouldn't worry about it. We'll stay with a <clears throat> very practical thing, which is right here. So if we want to do normalization, we're going to do this. So here's an example. We take, there's a graph, and uh, you will have in the homework one of those graphs. Uh, what, I, what I've done here, I actually calculated um, the number of nodes of different degrees. And uh, in this case, the graph is directed, right? So uh, for every node, we have incoming links and we have um, outgoing links, right? And uh, the incoming and outgoing links, they do have different distribution, which means, um, well, slightly different distribution, which means um, there, there are, like, like, like right here, um, the red is actually incoming, in, incoming links, and uh, yeah. blue is a distribution of the outgoing links. Um, and if you notice, actually, I'm, it's the other way around, I'm sorry. The red is a distribution of outgoing links. Red is out, uh, blue is in. Yeah. And um, if you notice, um, this is uh, the, the, the node degree. Right. If you think about this, this is a web, this is a piece of a web graph, and in the web graph there are some pages that have very very high node degrees. So there are a lot of pages pointing to them. Um, in general, web pages will have less out degree because out degree of the web page is really the links that person puts on the web page that connects it to other pages, right? And uh, the in degree it is the links that other people put there pointing to your page. And so it's obvious that, you know, if you're putting um, links, um, you, you know, eventually will put much less links than somebody, than, than you know, the, 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 the total sort of population uh, can put links to your page, right? And so that's why the in-degree um, distribution uh, will cut short, out-degree will go that far. Now, again, what's, what this says is the following. Well, let's see how many nodes, and, and well, this is normalized to be PDF, uh, right? If we don't normalize, it will be just a count of how many nodes, let's say, have degree distribution 1,000, right? Or how many nodes have degree distribu has, has degree 10, right? What's the probability? What the probability that randomly selected node will have a degree 10? or what the probability of that randomly selected node will have a degree one, or what probability that randomly selected node will have a degree star, uh, degree 100, <laughs> degree 100, um, um, et cetera, et cetera, right? So this is a probability that randomly selected node will have certain degree. Um, and degrees of uh, incoming links can be much higher than degrees of outgoing links. Um, but if you notice, it's it's all scattered, and um, we, we talked about this that you know we want we want to see power law, so we want us to fit a straight line, and it's kind of clear that you cannot fit a line in here really well. I mean, for red nodes, maybe you still can kind of go this 
but for you, it's very unclear what to do with this. And it's not nice. It's just, you know, the, the fact of life because distribution is discrete. You know, you have a node that has uh, the degree um, 10,000 and you have a node that has a degree above it and you have a node that has a degree below it and it's just, you know, single node with that degree and single node with that degree and single node with that degree. All right. In order to actually fit the distribution, in this case, um, we better look into um, the cumulative distribution function. If I calculate cumulative distribution function for the same distribution, which means and cumulative distribution function is in fact you know just an integral under um, these curves, that's what they're going to look like. So this is cumulative distribution function for incoming and uh, for outgoing um, links. Okay, now in this case, it's also not a perfect um, straight line. I mean, not at all a perfect straight line, um, but there is a fragment here that probably fits really well on a straight line and we can see um, here there is a very, very nice fit. And so it's gonna tell us that there are pieces of the distribution that actually follow, um, follow the straight line, so follow the power law. Now, what happens here um, is quite interesting. Well, and also here, why we have a drop. Well, the reason for that drop is because um, I actually pulled out a very small sample from the web, which means um, I, I cut it out uh, for nodes to have connections only within the sample, um, and if it continues to if it continue to have a connection with the outside world, I would expect this to go down that way, and and this also to continue, and not drop abruptly. So that's the effect of the finite sample size. But <clears throat> in here, it seems like it, it does a pretty good job um, in predicting. So if you want to do um, to to measure the the, the distribute the exponent in 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 the power law, uh, which is the slope in this case, right? One way to do it is to actually build um, a CCDF, you know, plot it, and then do you can try to do linear regression or something else in a CCDF, but uh, before doing it, you have to you have to actually eyeball the picture and figure out the regions, those intervals, where you want to do um, the, the mapping, where you want to do the, the feeding of the linear regression. Then you have a chance to get a reasonably good approximation for, um, for alpha, right? Remember, we want to, we want to try to estimate, um, want to try to find this alpha, and so we can get a pretty good estimate um, in here. Um, but of course, there are, there are better procedures than that. This is sort of a poor man procedure, which you know, allows you to eyeball things and, and, and you know, quick, quickly get, get the numbers. Um, you can do much better. Oh, before we go there, um, let me show you a few examples um, on, a, <clears throat> um, on, on the real networks. Um, so, <coughs> um, this is a power law network. There are several power law networks. On the left side, there is what's called a um, collaboration graph. Um, then there is a World Wide Web, and then this is a graph of power grid data. Um, very different, very different sizes of the networks coming from a very different uh, fields, but um, and, and have quite different properties. Like in, in the first case, in the collaboration actor collaboration network, it's the average degree is. 28 in the World Wide Web average degrees 5.6 in the Power Grid um, it's 5.5. Um, now here it's actually called gamma the the exponent. Um, if you notice, it's greater than two, uh, but sometimes it's less than three. You know, it's, here it's 2.3. Um, here it's 2.3. Um, here it's 2.1. Here it's four. Um, and, and there is small fragments. In fact, this is a very famous paper by um, 
Barabasi, Perfect. Albert 1999, that for the first time showed those distributions, distributions for uh, World Wide Web, um, for you know, actual collaboration networks, power grids, and actually attract the attention um, of the pe people's attention to this power law distributions. Um, I think it was published in Nature or in Science, one of those you know, very, very yeah. um, high profile magazines. Um, here is another example. Um, this is an example um, <clears throat> done by computer scientists, um, and this is a web crawl. Notice um, that the, the, those pictures, this is in degree and out degree. Notice the, the, the pictures fans out. Um, it sort of fans out because it's not a cumulative distribution function, it is a distribution function itself. So um, when, when the whole thing was just starting, and that was, you know, if you notice, 15 years ago, uh, people didn't realize that um, it's better to build, to draw cumulative distribution functions. Um, so that's one of the first papers that showed that uh, on the web, the distribution of the node degrees um, is, is, is following power law. Okay, so how do we actually estimate the parameter? What's sort of the right way to do it? Um, or sort of scientific way to do it? Well, the way to do it is to using what's called maximum likelihood estimation. Um, imagine that um, every point uh, in your graph, every point is generated um, independently uh, from some distribution, All right? So have some distribution and uh, those, and, and <clears throat> that distribution uh, generate, generate points for us. Um, well, <clears throat> if uh, we have, you know, this is the distribution we're dealing with, this is our power law and I just normalized it, um, it's with normalization, then probability of the sample um, is just uh, the probability of a bunch of independent points in this sample. So we just can calculate this as the product of the probabilities of um, every point in the sample. Then we're going to use Bayes' theorem just that says, okay, well, the probability of uh, parameter alpha given our data points is, uh, equal, is can be calculated through um, the probability of our model, well, if we have alpha to generate those data points times the a priori probability of um, the particular parameter alpha times the divided by the probability of the data points, right? Um, again, okay. since we're going to be doing maximum likelihood, we wouldn't care about um, this because we're going to be optimizing with respect to <clears throat> alpha. And in fact, since we don't have any a priori ideas on what alpha has to be, uh, we'll consider all sort of a priori, um, uh, a priori values of alpha equal um, in probabilities. And so P of um, alpha will also be a constant for us. So in some sense, you know, the use of Bayes theorem here is just to invert um, going from um, generating data points from, uh, from the distribution to actually estimating the parameter. But that's, that's a very tra standard trick um, for maximum likelihood estimations. So what you're gonna do is um, write down the log likelihood. And, and again, it's, it's, it's logarithmic. You know, if you've never done this, I, I strongly recommend you to do it at least once um, to do this exercise. Um, it, it's log likelihood. Um, you want it to, be, it to be logarithmic because you get rid of product um, and you write down everything as a sum. And now um, those xi's are uh, our data points. Lambda are parameters. And you want to find the parameter that optimizes this log likelihood. Well, the, the optimization is through, <clears throat> we'll try to maximize this log likelihood, uh, just taking standard derivative with respect to alpha. <coughs> and if you differentiate this uh, with respect to alpha, you realize that um, logarithm will become uh, one over alpha minus one. This will go away because it doesn't depend on alpha. Here, uh, you know, alpha will just go away and we'll, we'll, the sum remains. And so <clears throat> equating this to zero, uh, we can calculate alpha. And that's gonna be, well, that's gonna be the estimate for, um, for alpha. And alpha again, 
is our exponent, the value, the value of our exponent. We can actually also estimate um, standard error. Um, I'm not going to talk about it, but if you're interested, um, take a look um, at Mark Newman's paper. It's also uh, um, online as, as recommended reading for this lecture. Um, uh, there is a derivation of how you can actually calculate um, the, the standard error, the error estimate for this alpha. So if you notice in this formula, um, we have xi, which are data points. And so in fact, it's very, it, it's just trivial to um, estimate alpha. If you try to do this, you realize that it dramatically depends on x min. x min is that point, imagine that here we have our distribution. x min is that point from which we start, we start taking into account the distribution. And we can move it. And depending on the position of the six mean, um, the estimate of alpha will differ. So we need to find somehow x mean that, that does the best job in describing our distribution. So we need to find out starting where on a histogram we need to take um, the, the data points into account when we calculate alphas. <clears throat> and again, there is a pretty standard way to do it. Um, we're going to follow the following idea. Um, there is what's called Kalmagorov Smirnov test uh, we, that allows to compare uh, model and um, experimental cumulative density functions. Um, the idea is the following <clears throat> this is uh, the model that we generate. All right, um, and and this uh, we so so since we can calculate PDF, we can calculate CDF, we can calculate CCDF, we can calculate whatever we want. So here it's it's written for CDFs. So we can calculate CDF from our model by setting up parameter alpha and choosing x min, and this is experimental data. So uh, Kalmagor Kalmagorov Smirnov test says the following. Um, let's find the difference between them and <clears throat> let's look for the point, uh, let's maximize it with respect um, to x. And <clears throat> finding the largest difference will give us this d value. Then we can go through different, select different x means. For each x mean, we can calculate corresponding d value. Okay? Again, so this is a curve, this is a curve. We find the, differ the distance between them, which is also you know, a curve, but then we, we find the maximum distance, we find the, <clears throat> the maximum possible distance between them. So we find that x that provides the maximum distance. In this case, it's right here. And that's the d value. So then we can plot the d value as a function of x min, and we're gonna be looking for uh, the minimum in here. And, uh, sort of minimax principle, yeah, we're gonna be looking for um, the minimum value uh, on this curve. Um, if you've done machine learning, you, this might look a little bit familiar uh, because in machine learning, this is one of the way you actually tune up parameters. You go through the entire parameter space and you're looking uh, for um, some score or error metric and you look for the optimal in there. And in this case, we're just using this kalman gross smirnoff metric to define it. So, when you find x min, when you find x min, the optimal one, that tells you where on the distribution you need to start um, the, the, the mapping, where the mapping will be the optimal. Um, and, and you know the way it knows it is simply because um, when we calculate this f, we do use um, you know, the power law model. So if you're looking at the logarithmic graph, the power law model is a straight line. And so what it says is, how to position the straight line, where to start the straight line, such a way that the fit will be optimal. And sometimes it can give you, you know, the starting point somewhere here or somewhere here. Or sometimes it can tell you, well, you know what? You almost don't have a straight line. You just need to grab the last couple of points to get a straight line. And that will mean that you really don't have a power law distribution. But sometimes, you know, it will be like this. 
so pretty much what we went over is a very practical way to detect the power law distribution and calculate the coefficients. So first, um, when you do, when you have a power law data um, and you can compute uh, PDF, you can then do the CDF, um, which allows you to see a straight line in there. And then you can either uh, on uh, cumulative, either on CDF itself or on complementary CDF, you run Komogorov Smirnov test and uh, find the, the, the best spot to actually match a straight line. Um, here are a few examples. Again, <clears throat> if you run Kalmogorov Smirnov test, and, and uh, it has been done on those examples, um, you know, we, we, if you look closer later on the slides, you'll see there are, there, are, there are some lines there, but I'll just sort of emphasize here. Here it starts at this point. Um, here um, it's here. Um, you know, on the, on the pieces here, it starts straight line matching there. It's there. Well, here it just goes, I think, always through. So <clears throat> depending on your power law distribution, kolmogorov smirnov test will actually give you um, the point on that histogram, like here, from where to start your match. OK. okay. Um, the, the last. Um, sort of piece of this lecture is just to give you a quick um, example of power laws in, in somewhat different world um, in actually natural language processing. And the reason um, I want to talk about it is because um, this idea is a very, very powerful way to quickly plot um, distributions and uh, you know, to quickly be able to see um, if we have a power law or not, without going through histograms, which is actually pretty cool. So let's consider um, some you know, natural corpus, some language, um, and um, just words um, that, that use in the language. And here's an example. Um, in this example, um, there is a corpus size of 85 million different words. And out of those 85 million, it's, it's, it's actually a brown corpus, I believe. It's, it, you know, the brown is an eight meter. Um, out of that corpus, there is around 6,000 unique words, okay? And in the, in the, in the file, um, in this data, um, I just restricted to minimum frequency of 800, which means the word occurs 800 times um, in, in this data set. Right, uh, and say for example, the most frequent word is the. Um, that is, that happens more than six million times in this data set. Then v, more than four million times. Then off, you know, three million times, etc. And you know, this is not the bottom of the, of the actual data set. This is just the bottom of the sample. You know, the, the actual data set, the, the frequency of words goes goes even lower. Um, so the frequency table, what frequency table is simply the words sorted by their frequency, by the frequency um, with which they occur in our uh, corpus or, um, you know, the frequency that they occur in a in, in language because this is a pretty large um, sample um, of the language. And in fact, yes, the is the most frequent word um, in English, right? And then it follows by B, by off, um, uh, etc. So uh, you know you can you can build this easily for Russian. Okay, <clears throat> so that's called um, word frequency table. Well, um, in fact, um, in 1930s, um, American linguist uh, George Zipf uh, studied this, and um, he came up with what's called now, which which now known as a Zipf's law, um, which literally states that the frequency of a word in a natural language corpus is inversely proportional to its rank in the frequency table, which sounds <clears throat> a little crazy. It pretty much says um, that the frequency of uh, you know, the second word 
will be half of the frequency of the first word. The frequency of the third word will be half of the frequency of the second, of, of I'm sorry, will be the third of the frequency of the first word. Um, the frequency of the fourth word will be the quarter of the frequency of the first word, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You see that in this example, it's not exactly that way, but you know, close, close to it, right? So <clears throat> this law has been adjusted and updated a little bit um, to show that in fact, uh, we, <coughs> you know, we, we don't use just the frequency, it, it, just, just the ring, it's uh, one of a k to the power of s. There is some power s and, uh, you know, for different languages and for different actually part of the curve, um, this s might be, uh, might be different. But still, um, this, this law works. And uh, for example, here on this picture, you see the distribution of um, the words in um, <clears throat> Wikipedia. Um, and so what's done here is really, uh, we calculated the, <coughs> the rank frequency table, where on one axis, on one axis there's a rank, um, and on the other axis there are frequency. So we just plot, um, frequency or the function of rank or rank of the function of frequency. And you notice um, for the zip distribution, there are two pieces. Um, there are here, sort of straight part, and there are there straight part. And you can map to different straight lines, and those straight lines tell you that, okay, there is a distribution um, one over x squared, which is s equal to two, and uh, you know the green one is roughly one over x. So that's a very proximate law. And, and in fact, there has been many, very many theorists and some people believe why they, you know, they, they know why um, the language is, is, is distributed that way. Um, others say, you know, it's, it's not because of that. But um, the, the point is that if you take, um, if you take the, the, the words in language, sort them uh, by their frequency, on average, um, you know, the, the rank of the word, I mean, sorry, the frequency of the word, um, it will be inversely proportional to um, its rank, a sort of experimental law. Um, in fact, if you look at this, you realize that, well, this is, you know, it's, it's all, all over again the same power law we've been talking about, right? It's P of K C X to the power alpha. Um, it's just instead of X, we're using K, instead of S, we, we, we say here alpha, but this is a power law. Um, and where frequency is just inversely proportional to the rank, well, that's a power law with degree one. Okay. So why is this interesting for us? I mean, we're not linguists. I mean, it's kind of curious, but why bother? Well, the reason is the following. <clears throat> the reason is the following. Um, Imagine that we, we take items and, you know, we did it with words, but you can take it with, with any other items. Um, we can do it with, uh, you know, nodes in the graph. We sort items by their frequency in decreasing order, by the frequency of the appearance of items in decreasing order. So it's the same way as, um, as you did with, with words, okay? All right, now here is a key statement, that the fraction of the words with frequencies higher or equal to the kth word is actually, <clears throat> by definition, is a, a cumulative, is complementary cumulative distribution function. Because it's defined as a fraction, right? Fraction <clears throat> of those variables that are greater or equal to, to, than k. That's our definition. But at the same time, this fraction of the words, it's in fact nothing else than the rank of the word. Well, let, let, let's look at this. Let's say we take the word n, and well, how many words out of all the number of words have frequencies greater than n? When this guy, this guy, this guy, and n itself. So there are, if I calculate the CDF, um, it will be four, divided by the total number of, of, of words. 
But what's four? Well, four is really the rank of end. So what happens is the rank, the rank of the word in uh, the frequency table is actually, actually gives us, when normalized properly, gives us a complementary cumulative distribution function. Now, this is not a very trivial statement. Um, I, I encourage you to you know, look at this statement and think about it, but the consequences are very interesting. In order for us to plot a CCDF, what we need to do is to just sort the items we have in a decreasing order, and then plot what's called rank frequency, create rank frequency plot which is put rank of the item in the table on the y-axis and put the frequency of its occurrence on the x-axis. And if we do that, we'll actually get a, a plot of cumulative distribution function of that quantity. So if you want to look at the node degrees, uh, we can just sort all the nodes in the decreasing order and then plot um, the rank of the nodes versus um, the, the, the frequencies of the currents of those nodes, and that will create for us um, CCDF. So in fact, um, if we just want to do CCDF, we don't even need to uh, do histograms. We don't need to do histograms, we don't need to do integration of the histograms, we can just do simple counting. Um, and uh, here's an example of that <clears throat> done uh, for, for uh, Zipf's law, the one you just saw. So where what I did is um, I took um, word ranks, so I sorted the words um, based on the frequency, right? And the word rank number one has this frequency, right? The word number rank number two has this frequency, the word number five, well, that's the frequency of that word, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And so when you do that, and then of course you plot this in log log scale, this is log, right? And this is log, you'll get a straight line. And you get straight line for Zipf's law, uh, we'll get a, you know, almost straight line uh, for uh, when, when we look at the networks. And so that's sort of a trick, but a very, very practical trick um, I, I encourage you to use um, when you look at the networks. So that's pretty much it for today. Um, there are several references. Um, they're all available on the website. Um, I, I, I would recommend you to read. Um, there is a power law of Pareto distribution and Zips law. Uh, it's paper by Mark Newman. Um, it's quite lengthy, uh, but you know, probably the, the first part of it is pretty good. Um, and um, uh, power law distribution empirical data, that's another paper, uh, it's 2009, that actually talks more about how to uh, measure the power law and it uh, talks about kolmogorov smirnov tests and things um, related to that. And if you want to learn why, um, you know, one of the theories why uh, we have power laws all over the place, well, here is this, the third paper, uh, the history of generative models for power law and log normal distribution, which is also you know, quite an interesting read. Um, all three of them are available um, on, on the website for the class. Um, and that's it for today. Any questions? Well, it scares me when there are no questions.